Thank you, everybody. Come over here. Uh, my name is Ki Dong. I'm the docent at Museum of Flight. Um, I'm the only Mandarin-speaking docent in Museum of Flight. Uh, since I do have a very close tie with Taiwan uh, Republic of China Air Force, so I uh, got help from that uh, uh, ROC uh, veteran group and Black Bat Foundation and many other friends from Taiwan. We put together this uh, CIA and uh, Black Bat uh, 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 presentation for you. Hopefully you can uh, learn from this uh, historical event the joint venture between Taiwan and the CIA. Uh, the next one, we will introduce uh, uh, Mr. Ling, Lieutenant uh, Colonel, to kick off this event. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Angus Lin from Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in San Francisco. I'm the liaison officer from there. And firstly, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Kel Wilcox and uh, Mr. Dan Ki for inviting me. I'm very honored to participate in this event on behalf of Republic of China Air Force. Being here today gave me the unique opportunity for me to commemorate the great deed of the Black Bat Squadron, the 34th Squadron in our Air Force. And also being here, gave me a great opportunity to visit the Museum of Flight and the beautiful city of Seattle, also the great state of Washington, all for the first time in my life. <clears throat> the Black Bat Squadron is one of the best examples that demonstrate the great weather of ROC Air Force. From 1952 to 1972, the squadron flew about 823 missions, and during which 148 officers were killed with 15 aircraft down. The best airmen of our Air Force at that time were chosen to receive the toughest trainings in the United States and to <clears throat> prepare themselves for the secret low altitude reconnaissance missions over mainland China. And two thirds of them make the ultimate sacrifices for the following missions they were assigned for. <clears throat> so I think it's a very good opportunity for everyone here to imagine that how much courage will, uh, will it take for airmen to continue to perform his duty when you see so many of his fellow could not make it home one after one. And among all the successful missions the Black Bat Squadron carried out, the operational heavy T, the topic of, this today, uh, of today, also called Qilong Project in Chinese, is one of the most significant ones. Following a successful nuclear test by People's Republic of China in 1964, the US Central Intelligence Agency and the Republic of Air Force, Republic of China Air Force worked together to launch the operation to gather information near the nuclear test site. On May 17, 1969, the crew of 12, after receiving a seven month secret training in the United States, took off from Takli Royal Thai Air Force Base in an uh, unmarked Air Force C-130E aircraft. They flew for six and a half hours and at a very low altitude in the dark. They arrived over the target and the sensor pilots were dropped by the parachute near the test site in Jiang, uh, Gansu province. After another six and a half hours, <clears throat> they flew back to the air, the air base and the sensors worked and uploaded the data to the intelligence satellites of the US and until the battery worked out. The successful of the mission enabled the outside world to peek into mainland China to see its latest development of its nuclear weapon. So the 
whole world can respond and, uh, and plan according to it. More importantly, it symbolizes the long-standing friendship and brotherhood between the United States and the Republic of China. To defend democracy and maintain peace in any difficult times. Remembering the history of Black Bat Squadron and the Operation Heavy T today, will also remind us how long we have fought together for the values we share and how important it is for us to continue to cooperate to take all the future challenges. Last but not the least, I would like to take this opportunity to honor Captain V.A. James Wynn. I think we have his, yes. <clears throat> Captain Jim Wynn was a retired Navy aviator and passed peacefully at home on June 8, 2018. We were saddened by his passing the Republic of China Air Force is grateful for and will always remember his contributions to help training the Black Bat Squadron between the 1962 and the 1964 during his assignment to Taipei, Taiwan. And then we have more. Oh, this is his information for everyone's reference. Once again, many thanks to the Museum of Flight for making this event possible. I look forward to listening to the uh, remarkable presentations from Mr. Art Wing and also Mr. Li Wang for the following. Thank you very much. Actually, uh, you can see Jim Wing over here. Uh, he was original one of the, the presenters supposed to be in this e program, but unfortunately he passed away in June 8th. So uh, following, we have a two minutes uh, uh, videotape to show that uh, funeral processions. Let me see. He was buried at the Tacoma uh, National Cemetery in Kent. Art Wynn and Bob Wynn are the um, Jim Wynn's uh, uh, two sons. Would you stand up and let everybody see? Yeah, there's Art Wynn <laughs> and Bob Wynn. Okay. Uh, next, we want uh, uh, Art come over here to give you more detail 
um, history regarding about uh, his father's career, especially in CIA and um, uh, Taiwan's that uh, black bat assignment. have to figure out how to use the uh, clicker here. Um, I want to thank everyone involved, uh, Kale Wilcox, Key Don, the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office, Colonel Lin, my new best friend, Li Wang, and Homing Cho as well for being with us today. It is a privilege to share the stage with these honorable people. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Black Bats, at least from my experience as uh, someone growing up with a father involved with them. Um, we'll discuss their origins, the special operations that was their focus, and we'll also talk about some of the aircrafts that they used that were mission specific and built entirely for the 34 Squadron, and it just happened to be a plane that was a favorite of my father's. A Little bit about me. I was born in San Francisco. My brother and I were part of a typical Navy family, which meant we moved a lot. By 10th grade, I'd been in 10 different schools, and you know, my education wasn't done yet. But one of those schools, two actually, were in Taipei, uh, old enough to attend the St. Ignatius Jesuit School briefly, and then transfer to the Taipei American School. Uh, later on in life, I would go to the UW uh, School of Business and ultimately work for Paul Allen at several of his businesses, uh, one particularly in training and development where we were a partner with Boeing and helped facilitate the development of the 777. So let me tell you a little bit about my father. He was born in Tacoma went to the University of Washington, and there is a, a quote here from Chris Pocock I'd like to read about these people, because uh, as Chris says here, some people never get the recognition that they deserve. This is particularly true of those who work in the secret world. They sign their oaths, and then they keep them for life, and my father was like that. But before he died, he did have the chance to work with author Chris Pocock and author Clarence Fu, and they wrote what I think is one of the definitive publications on this history, and it's called The Black Bats, the story of CIA overflights from Taiwan over the mainland China. So we've seen this picture before. Um, I, I like this one. This is actually the original artwork. There's a a new version of the insignia for the black bats, uh, but this was the original one that I copied from one of his documents. And it is a little bit different, but again, we see the emphasis on the red circle and then the black bats mission of piercing that red circle surrounding Taiwan and the rest of the world. Um, Jim was a, a native of Tacoma. He attended the University of Washington and then became a naval aviator in September of 1955. While stationed in Corpus Christi, where he was uh, instructing new naval pilots on the S-2 aircraft, his outstanding reputation as a pilot and instructor was established. And in March of 1962, with family in tow, he reported to headquarters support activity in Taipei, Taiwan. His primary mission was as a training officer, teach them how to fly our aircraft, but he was also the assistant operations officer, which means that he knew the nature of the missions and the risks and the daring involved. Um, for his achievement with the 34 Squadron, he'd ultimately be awarded wings in the Chinese Air Force. When the mission, when the uh, transfer orders first came across to him, my father writes, he was in, I was in the regular Navy as an instructor pilot flying S-2s when the assignment came up. My task was to provide basic flight training to the Chinese crews. I believe that I was selected for this project because I had over 2,000 hours flying the P-2V Neptune. And this is the plane right here, and what we're looking at is a rendering, but this aircraft literally bulged with electronic intelligence gathering equipment. 
electronic intelligence was a primary mission of the Black Bat Squadron. And the P-2 had become the selected platform for these new intelligence gathering technologies. Um, a significant part of the mission really was to probe the radar defenses around the mainland and help identify where we might find chinks in the armor, if you will, gaps in the coverage for their radar. My father flew a number of planes, and these are the ones that he provided instruction on to the uh, members of the 34th Squadron. The S-2F, a marine patrol craft, the P-2V, his favorite, and the one he had the most hours in, as well as the C-47 and the B-26. Um, the P-2 was especially his favorite, and of course he had the most time in it. This aircraft is notable for a lot of reasons, but it was at that point when we were transitioning from piston-driven engines to jet engines. And as you see what they've done is they've hung a couple of jet engine pods onto the wings, giving it an extra kick. And again, the plane is bulging with electronics. You've got a big dome underneath the belly, three antennas underneath the fuselage at the tail. And in this particular picture, it has a US Air Force uh, label on it. The fact is the Air Force never operated this plane at all. It's kind of interesting that this picture exists as one of the few of this particular P2V7, also known as the RB69, that was so equipped with this intelligence gathering technologies. Um, quite an aircraft, quite an aircraft. These are the jet pods. Um, these were aviation gas burning J-34 engines, and they literally were unthrottled. So when they would light these things, it was like hitting the turbo boost button in a modern video game. It threw you in the back of your seat, and you had additional power for takeoff or perhaps maneuvers in combat. One of the rare pictures of the P-2, and this one here shows where they were finally allowed to arm themselves. Many of the missions that these guys flew, they weren't armed at all. In fact, if they were shot down, the first thing they did was throw their guns away. Um, it was really almost futile to go armed against the People's Republic of China at this point in time. But here was a case where they put Sidewinder missiles, normally uh, uh, attached to uh, jet aircraft interceptors and such, but that was the nature of the P-2's versatility as a platform. It could handle the maneuvers necessary in a dogfight and could utilize those missiles when it needed to. This is a, uh, a photo of the ceremony where my father was granted his wings in the Chinese Air Force. Uh, my father will be the gentleman right here. And next to him is the general. This gentleman here is Willie Homan. And Willie was electrical intelligence gathering specialist. And next to him is someone I want us to keep an eye on as well. This is Bob Klyla. Throughout my life, Bob was never far away from where we were stationed with my father and always seemed like a member of the family. But these three men in particular had a lot to do with the 34th Squadron, their missions, and ultimately, at Bob's suggestion, Mission Heavy T. Down below, we have a picture of the old headquarters at Sinchu from 1962, and again, a copy of the uh, Wing Awards for uh, my father's participation with the 34th Squadron. One of our favorite people that we met when we were stationed there, and my dad called him number one student, was Chu Chen, Zhu Zhen. Um, Chu and his wife were very close friends of the family. We stayed in touch with them through this through the centuries even, but through the decades. This was a picture of their young families, 1963 in Taiwan. And uh, the little thought on the right with the Chinese inscription was a gift from Chu when we had a reunion in uh, 1999. And I'm told that essentially it says the, the luck, the, the fortune by which people are brought together and the friendships that evolve. And that is how we felt about all of our friends uh, there. It was just outstanding people to be associated with. One of the pictures from the reunion here, which was in 99 on 1010, obviously, we have, uh, oops, 
wrong button there. We have uh, Bob Kleila here on the end, my father. This is Fred Savaro here. Next to him is Jack Whitaker. Next to Jack is Colonel Chow Chin in the back there. And this is Willie Homan, who was really the first electrical intelligence specialist uh, to help design the missions and uh, equipment required for these missions. And so uh, part of the tour when we visited in 1999 was to go revisit the operations center. And you can see it had fallen down a bit. I'm anxious to see the museum myself, and I look forward to getting to Sinshu to do that. So again, with the reunion here, I wanted to show this picture one more time. Not only was uh, Bob Kleila an outstanding representative American individual and citizen of the world, his wife Helen over here was outstanding as well. These two were both lifelong CIA officers, both equivalent to a four-star admiral uh, level. Um, and this was our part of the tour. But keep an eye again on Bob as we go through my presentation. Ultimately, I'm going to switch to a point where we talk a bit about the history and less about the people. But this mission is really a lot to do with Bob's input, Helen's input, Jim Wynn's input, of course, Willie Homan as well. Um, Bob passed away in 2008. Although he helped Chris Pocock put the book together, he did not live to see the uh, publishing of it. And, uh, that was sad. His wife, Helen, lived until 2015 and was 102 years old at her passing. And again, just two outstanding, very powerful people within the organization. One of our last photos, of course, we had to have dinner with General Chen and uh, my family before we left the reunion there. And it was, again, one of the highlights of my life just to uh, meet these people who I had grown to admire so much growing up. So. I want to talk about the relationship, Taiwan, its partnership with the USA, and particularly the intelligence community there. But first, let's consider the regional state of affairs around Southeast Asia at this point in time. 1927 brought civil war to China. It was really a battle of ideologies. It was Mao versus Chang, communism versus alternatives, capitalism, what have you. Uh, in the United States during this point, 1927 meant the pending end of the Roaring Twenties. So we were about to enter the Depression, China was in the midst of a civil war, and in China, it meant the end of warlord rule, the rise of nationalism. The rise of Marxist-Leninism was occurring all over the globe thanks to the Russians. Personality cults were built. I'm not so sure that what we can't say about Mao, Marx, Lenin, all of them, cults of personality helped cement their power. So this civil war would last 10 years in China, the nationalist versus the communist. And then in 1937, it would have to be put on hold because the Japanese had now invaded. They came through Korea and it was full-scale war as the Jap Japanese subjugated the Chinese and were guilty of many atrocities. We have a, a picture of a street scene with a recruiting poster from the Kuomintang, the Nationalists, and it was uh, this way to the front, boys. So how did the war start? What, what was the cause of the Sino-Japanese conflict? had to do with the so-called Marco Polo Bridge incident, which occurred on July 7, 1937. Um, the Japanese military had demanded to enter the uh, Chinese city of Wanping to search for an AWOL soldier, someone who was absent without leave. The village was sequestering him and giving him shelter. And so the answer from the Chinese administration was, we're not going to give your soldier back. The Japanese upped the scale with an ultimatum they were prepared to declare war if they couldn't get their soldier back, but the Chinese still refused. And so the Japanese marched across the bridge, and that began the uh, Sino-Japanese War. It was interesting because both the USA and the USSR would find common cause with the nationalists. And at this point in time, both were supporting China against Japan. So 
as the Sino, as the Japanese invasion caused the Civil War to be put on hold, the Nationalists and the Communists would unite with the USA and the USSR to fight Japan. There are obviously questions of uh, ideological compatibility here, but uh, this was actually the second Sino-Japanese War, and uh, it interrupted the Chinese Civil War, which would again get started again in 1946, but some of the lowlights were the Nanking Massacre. This, as much as anything, galvanized the world to understand how really barbarous Japanese tactics in war had become. So there was sympathetic U.S. foreign policy, and we formed alliances, and we agreed to fight communism. We had tools that we would use, like proxy warfare and espionage that would muddy the waters quite a bit and make it difficult to really know the good guys from the bad guys, but we knew. And then, in 1941, Japan hit us again. This time, not the Chinese, but the United States forces stationed at Pearl Harbor. It was an eventful year. Um, a couple of pictures here are from the American Volunteer Group, later to become the Flying Tigers, P-40 Warhawk. But this was a shock to all of us. America had stayed carefully neutral in the European theater at this point in time, but now there was no going back. We were in the war. They attacked the U.S. fleet. We entered the war, and the Flying Tigers entered the fight. Um, the relationship between the Republic of China and the USA can be said to have gone operational with the Flying Tigers. Who were the Flying Tigers? It was the first American volunteer group, and they served from 41 to 42, led by Claire Chenault. Uh, they were trained in Burma. Their mission was to fight the Japanese and defend China. And the U.S. was very anxious to start attacking Japan. Their first operational mission came just 12 days after the attack on Pearl Harbor. And this is when we fought together against the Japanese. There were other things going on in the area. There was the Korean Peninsula was now becoming a hot spot. Uh, Japanese, Manchuria, Taiwan, they were everywhere, and we needed to get them out. This war the Chinese Civil War, World War II as it were, it ended with an Allied victory over Japan thanks to the U.S. development of the atomic bomb. The atomic bomb is part of the theme that I want to discuss as we move forward here. But essentially, this is where we got the foundation for the 34th Squadron. All of the volunteers were, oops, all of the volunteers were members of the uh, Chinese Air Force and uh, this particular squadron was well known for its innovative and tactical missions, so mission victories. Uh, interesting thing about Claire Chenault, Claire's unit was the Flying Tigers, and not long after that, Japan actually made an invasion into Alaska. At that time, Claire had a son named Claude, and Claude too had a squadron of P-40 Warhawks, and what Claude did was call them the Aleutian Tigers, and he was actually one of the first to fight the Japanese in North America. So a small coincidence there. The, uh, the record of the uh, uh, AVG uh, was that they destroyed 296 aircraft while only losing 14 pilots. But we're getting to the end of the war here, and as you can see, the nuclear age really put all hostilities on hold. We had to understand the implications of nuclear technology and what it would mean to the future of the world. Uh, the bomb on the left is Nagasaki, uh, Hiroshima. The bomb on the right is Nagasaki. The first one is a uranium bomb. The second one is a hydrogen bomb. Magnitude's more powerful. We can kind of see that in the uh, uh, image left by the, the mushroom cloud. Um, in total, the estimate is that 120,000 to 250,000 Japanese were killed in the initial explosion and uh, due to uh, radiation illnesses later. 1945 was a busy, <clears throat> excuse me, 1945 was a busy year. Many things were going on. I've got a picture from history here. At the end of the war, the United States helped broker a face-to-face -face meeting between the nationalists and the communists. And here's a picture from that meeting in 1945 where Mao and Chang met for one final time, 
and we hoped it would bring an end to the Chinese Civil War, but that wasn't to be. So with the failure of that conference and the war in the Pacific coming to an end, Japan ultimately surrendered in September of 1945. And at that point in time, the Chinese Civil War would again resume, unfortunately. One of the uh, conferences were held constantly to talk about war tactics, war strategies, and what would the post-war world look like under our leadership. This picture on the left actually shows Chiang Kai-shek with Roosevelt and Churchill, Madam Chang, and this is the Cairo Conference. Um, the Cairo Conference was really talking about the Japan strategy, but at that conference for the first time, the US government recognized and designated the Republic of China as the administrative organization for China. Next to that is a picture from the Yalta Conference, more familiar to those of us who follow the European theater, but Stalin, Roosevelt, and Churchill again. And just a little plug for myself, I, I was able to visit Yalta in the Ukraine and uh, that is a picture of me in front of the writing desk used by Winston Churchill at Labadia Palace in the Ukraine. And it's a beautiful city, I recommend it, and the palace is just unbelievable. Uh, the wealth, the beauty, very compelling. So with the detonation of the bomb, we'd reached the end of World War II. Um, one of the, oh, I'm, you know, I'm skipping again here. Russia had promised to join the fight. Out of the Cairo conference came a couple of, uh, and the Yalta conference, came some uh, edicts that uh, would establish the United Nations, the foundation for the United Nations, the end of the uh, League of Nations, and the establishment of the United Nations and its Security Council was codified. And Russia had promised to join to help fight against the Japanese in this brief period between the, uh, ultimately the detonating, detonating of the atomic bombs and the uh, involvement of the US in the Pacific Theater after December 7th, 1941. Um, so the second Sino-Japanese War did result in the Allied defeat of Japan, but it also meant the renewal of the Chinese Civil War. And right away, based on our friendships and alliances built from the Cairo Conference and beyond, the United States cast its lot with the nationalists, the Kuomintang, while Mao himself, of course, fell in line with all of the other Marxist, Leninist, Engels, Stalin, communist philosophies and theologies, I like to consider them. Um, This is where it put us at the beginning of the Cold War. We had the People's Republic of China, the USA, USSR, and Taiwan, all very important, the decisions being made and the battles being fought here. Characteristics of the Cold War, I mean, what, what is a Cold War? What does it represent? I mean, it's really anything short of a, a shooting war. It's essentially a political, strategic, and ideological differences between the US brand of capitalism and the Russian-Chinese brand of communism. And it was a battle between those two ideologies. The struggle would contain everything short of direct war, but we did have, uh, we did have tools at our disposal that would allow us to uh, engage the challenge that was presented by these ideologies. Some of those strategies included proxy war, clearly with uh, the state of the Korean Peninsula after the Japanese invasion and the fall of Japan, uh, the US, the Chinese, and the Russians set up a, a proxy war there, hearts and minds, that sort of thing. But it was a, a game of brinksmanship. Up in the far right corner, we have a cartoon from the era that shows Khrushchev arm wrestling with President Kennedy both sitting on hydrogen bombs, each with their finger poised above the button. It was a game of brinksmanship, and it seemed like we would walk to the edge, and here at home in America, we became very uh, fearful of that edge and what going beyond it might mean. Espionage, of course, is one of our tools. 
foreign aid. We would use our foreign aid selectively for those countries that would ask for it. We would provide it. We would make alliances, like the one with the Republic of China. And propaganda was not so much a tool used by the United States, I'd like to think, but clearly the Russians were and continue to be the experts at propaganda. Picture of Stalin navigating the, the ship that is the USSR. Nuclear proliferation was a big concern to us, and in 1949, some of our worst fears were realized, or what some considered our worst fears. Russia detonated the bomb. Their first design was very similar to the Fat Man hydrogen bomb that we had detonated over Nagasaki. Um, but the big concern was, the Russians have the bomb too. I mean, we were very worried. What does it mean in communist-held China and the Korean Peninsula now that the Russians have this technology. Well, it meant the Korean War was gonna start, a proxy war had begun. It also meant Russian cooperation. Russians helped support Chinese efforts to acquire nuclear technology. The Chinese helped provide the production of fissile materials so that the Soviets could make more bombs for their purposes. Um, so with the 50s converging at the beginning of the next decade, we see that the Chinese Civil War ends. Technically, it kind of fizzled out with the nationalists all fleeing to Taiwan. The Korean armistice was signed. Three years after the war with Korea began, we acknowledged the stalemate, and we walked away from the table, I think, as much as anything, because we were afraid of the nuclear implications if we went further. So we just put that war on the back burner, and it still kind of sits there today. But the 34 Squadron Special Missions Group was formed. And with that, we had the formal relationship and the foundation for the Black Bats. And again, then the Soviet Union detonated their hydrogen bomb in 53. So what the US was able to accomplish in six days, their first uranium bomb followed by the hydrogen bomb, it took the Soviet Union four years to catch up. We knew they were behind us, but the question was, is there a way to, to be aware of where they stand in the development of their nuclear materials? This was a question that they would consider for a long time. So we had Stalin dying in 1953 and enabled Khrushchev's rise to power. Russia considered itself to be the true leader of the communist world, and China was expected to acknowledge that. Mao objected to Khrushchev's arrogance, but he did embark on a program to cooperate so that he would acquire the bomb. Initially, Mao felt that 60 to 70 nuclear missiles would be all it needed for its regional aspirations, and the relationship with the Russians was gonna be based on the Chinese ability to produce these fissile, material, fissile materials, and then the Russians to be able to transfer the technology to enable the People's, uh, People's Republic of China to construct their own bombs. But Mao and Khrushchev were not compatible that much, and their versions of communism were each different and self-serving in their own uh, ways. Um, the Russians were never able to convince Mao that they would be the one true center for the communist world, and Mao objected to the Russian arrogance in suggesting such. But after years of uh, production working together, the Russians would abruptly leave China in 1959 to 1960 without completing the bomb they'd promised as contractually agreed. And by 1960, all the Russian engineers would be back in Russia. China would have to finish the bomb on its own. And here they are. Um, they would detonate their first atomic bomb four years later in 1964, followed by their first hydrogen bomb in 1967. It was clear to the American leadership the atomic race was on. Um, where we had using technologies available at the time, the 34th Squadron had previously flown missions capturing air samples over China, to bring those back and analyze uh, the signatures that might be attached therein. Atmospheric sampling was not gonna be enough to understand exactly where they were in the development of their bombs. So uh, this is when uh, my father was then stationed at the Pentagon, and Bob Cliley would have been stationed in Langley. Bob, as you'll recall, had two tours as the uh, operations officer for the 34th Squadron. And my brother and I are pretty sure somewhere back in the uh, mid-60s there, my father and Bob, they were getting together again at the house in Arlington, Virginia, and we think that they probably were talking about 
mission heavy tea. Anyway, nuclear proliferation was now a reality. Russia had the bomb, China had the bomb, and back here at home in the new US, we were getting nervous. And that was reflected in its impact on our culture here. Um, we had the rise of McCarthyism, essentially something right out of George Orwell, 1984. We had the House Un-American Activities Committee that would elicit false testimony and we would blacklist people who were claimed to have communist sympathies. People were given loyalties. One of the big developments was the acceptance of the bomb shelter. This was marketed as something for every home. With the imminent threat of what we all felt was a coming nuclear war, bomb shelters were the must-have uh, item for every home. We had foreign policies that were specific in that time, too. Here's a, a great picture of one of those bomb shelters, too, by the way. Uh, we had the Korean War. We had an arms race with the Russians. And uh, we were also living with the Eisenhower Doctrine and the Truman Doctrine. The Truman Doctrine simply was, we're going to contain communism. We're going to box them in and not let them spread. The Eisenhower Doctrine was one that said, countries that request American assistance, if they're being threatened with armed aggression from any other state, will get it didn't give us comfort at home to know that we were extending our, our security that far, but the pervasive fear and the threat of nuclear conflict uh, would keep nuclear war a discussion on the table from then on. So at this point, we've kind of identified the needs for the mission. Although we'd done routine air sampling before by hanging pods from the P-2, uh, the need was recognized for intimate intelligence. We had to get down on the ground to take the kind of readings that we would know would tell us where they were in the development of their atomic bomb, how close they would be to a hydrogen bomb. Um, we also knew that the Chinese and the Soviets had split. Nuclear development uh, was unclear on where China might be after, uh, after the two tests that they made. How would we accomplish this mission of gathering the intelligence. At this time, Bob was in Langley, Jim was in the Pentagon, and the 34th was in Sinshu. Here's Bob Clyla here, and here's my father flying the P-2. And I'd like to read a, a small section from Bob Clyla's notes uh, for Chris Pocock in the book Black Bats. Oops. This is Bob Clyla speaking. I was still an air operations officer in the strategy and options division. So he really focused on what the options were and the detail behind uh, creating these very sophisticated, complicated missions. Um, Bob suggested that the new sensor package, and these were the equipment designed to detect radiation and, and measure uh, uh, physical uh, earthquake type uh, readings. Uh, Bob said the new, new uh, sensor package could be dropped by air into a remote area of China by a C-130s transport. The aircraft would have to be specially equipped to fly low over China to avoid detection by the Chinese radars. And again, the 34th knew where the vulnerabilities in the radar were. That was their mission, probe the radar defenses. Who could fly a large airplane all the way from Thailand into the Northwest on a deniable basis to the US? Bob said, of course, it was the 34th Squadron of the Chinese Air Force. These are the men of heavy tea. And this was the moment when they decided to put the mission into planning and effect. At this point, I'm going to invite Lee Wong up, but I have one more thought. And that is that, uh, in my opinion, and I'm quoting and Alexander Solzhenitsyn here, justice is conscience, not a personal conscience, but the conscience of the whole of humanity. Um, these men who I have been lucky enough to know, these men were of that special conscience for all mankind. And for having that conscience, they were able to do the impossible, and that is Mission Heavy T. Thank you all for your time. I look forward to questions. Mr. Wong.
I'm supposed to uh, talk about the uh, execution of the uh, heavy tea. And Art did a great job telling you how this uh, mission come to a need to, to be executed and what they supposed to learn. So at the time, the CIA decided this is okay, we're gonna airdrop the uh, two scientific instruments into the communist uh, nuclear test site, Loch Nor. And which two instruments they're gonna use? Is one is the uh, air analyzer, which is to determine what kind of a nuclear material that they use from the, uh, from the fault hours. And the other one is a seismic uh, the instruments. So whenever they, they have a nuclear test, they can measure how much the Earth is move. But then it says, this is the, what they need, okay? Then it's come with the, uh, the issues. How do you, you know, to deliver the, the instrument there? And everybody know at the time, China has the uh, closed door policy. And uh, they're very difficult for anyone to go in and out of there. And nevertheless, you know, you're going to uh, ship the, uh, the instruments. How are you going to get it there? And of course, like uh, Bob Klyer says, so we're going to use the C-130. But then it says, okay, we're going to use the C-130, even we know what aircraft we're going to use and who's going to fly it. But then after you drop it, you ob obviously you're going to use the parachute to drop it. And then how do you dispose the, you know, the parachutes? And the lastly is uh, how do you disguise the, the instrument? You don't, you don't want anybody to walk on the test there, test side there and see this huge in instrument there, right? So if they have the issue there, then they're gonna have the solutions. And one thing the CIA, they, you know, they have a plan there is the experts. Okay, the first thing is how they're going to put it in there, so C-130. And the C-130 has to be flying, like Bob Klyer says, with the pilots from the 34th Squadron, the Black Bats. But the only problem at that time in the Chinese Air Force in Taiwan, they does not have the C-130. So in the whole Chinese Air Force, they don't have anyone know how to fly this aircraft. So then they're gonna say, okay, we're gonna send them to the United States for the training. And the second question, remember what I was saying is, uh, how do you dispose the parachutes? And of course, the uh, expert from the CIA determines is all the parachutes and the, uh, the core of the parachutes, they're gonna put the ex small explosive device every five inches on the parachutes, even from the core. So after it dropped down to the, uh, the test site, and the moment that it hit the ground, it will trigger the fuse, and it will blow up the parachutes into pieces. And when they're doing this at night, with the, uh, the wind was blowing, the next day you're not gonna see anything. Yeah. And the, the last is how are you gonna disguise the instruments? And they study the area they're gonna drop that and they find out they have a plenty of rocks, boulders. So they determine that they're gonna, on the outside of the instrument, they're gonna make it look like a boulder. So after they drop there, so no one will notice. Okay, the training, all the, uh, in exactly 50 years ago, this month, September 1968, there's uh, two team of uh, the cer certain people each. They're gonna s they were sent it to the United States for the, uh, for the training. The flight crews, the pilots and the flight engineers, they were sent to Seward Air Force Base in Tennessee for the flight training. And on the aircraft, they have pilots, flight engineers, and the electronic warfare officers, navigators, and low masters. But just the pilots and the uh, flight engineers that were sent to Seward Air Force for training. And the rest of the crew, they were sent to, the, uh, they were sent to Groom Lake 
for the specialized training. In Groom Lake, you know, it's just, uh, the, they also call it the Area 51. You know, it's a lot of the rumors about that base. You know, all the aliens they captured, it was, it was kept there. And they especially, and they, all the new military equipments, they were tested there. So for the, the, uh, the electronic warfare officers and the navigators, they were sent there because on that aircraft, they have all this new technologies they're going to put onto the, uh, the aircraft. And at that time, 1968, this is a you know, top secret base. They were saying that that's the place you cannot get there from here. Okay, this is this was the uh, the photo was taken. The crew be there the very second day in the morning that they find out overnight there was a snowfall, and snowfall is quite common in the United States, but for the people from Taiwan, that's a very rare sight. So every members of the uh, the team they were so excited, they went out and they would play with the snow. And one was a lucky photo was taken for the. Uh, for Major He, he was sitting here, yeah. yeah. Now he was there, they took the photos, and not knowing this is right after that, the, uh, the, all the officers from the, uh, the Pentagon, they come and say they confiscated all the cameras. You're not gonna use the camera here. And then during the entire training period, they were keeping off, you know, off the side of all the American per, uh, the military per personnel. So only the support personnel and their training officers that know they, uh, they are there. They have not seen any other people on, the, on that huge base. So if they didn't see anybody else, that means all the Americans did not know there's Chinese on the base. But I read another book, because somehow we were saying this, is one guy was, at that time, was the, uh, explaining the, uh, the new airfoil. He was on that base. He said, I swear I saw a Chinese guy there. But when after he told his uh, commanding of, uh, uh, officer, he says, I think there's Chinese on the base. The officer was looking at him and says, you must see things. <laughs> And then it says, at night time, it was just so secret. And now you can just go onto the, uh, your computer and look at the Google. You can have this. You can look the whole, it, the whole base. You can see it. The, uh, this is the runway. And this is a huge dry, uh, dry lake, which you know, the airplane can take off in any directions. Yeah. Yeah, since I was saying this, is they're going to put the new technology on this flight. And the very first thing that they come across is uh, called forward-looking in infrared. And with this thing here, I don't have to explain how this thing here works, but you can see the two photos was taken at the same time. One is regular vision. You just see it with your naked eye. This one was with the flare. You can basically, you can turn the, you know, the night into day. So when they fly at night, you can actually see everything. And the second thing is a terrain following radar. This will, if you set the altitude to about any, the airplane will maintain the set all altitude above the ground. So when doing the uh, flying the uh, operation heavy T, after they get into the China territories, they were setting the altitude to 500 feet. So the airplane was hugging, they're flying at 500 feet above the ground and following the, uh, the shape of the terrain. Even they have a hill, they're gonna go over it. At the top of the hill, it's the same 500 feet. And the lastly is the new navigation equipment at that time. Inertia navigation system. 
And that's the uh, first generation of the INS. And it requires a very large gyros turning at a constant speed, at very high, high speed. I used the two graph that you can do the comparison at the, the first generation com compared to with the human. It was a huge, huge box. On the uh, back of the C-130, so almost about one third of the place, they have to put this in him there. And then this is, before takeoff, it takes about two hours for them to have the navigator have to go onto the airplane to align, you know, because that you know exactly on the ground that you know what's the longitude and the latitude of the your position. And then you have to align, make the gyro believe you are at that place. And from then on, they just, this will track every movement of the, uh, the aircraft, will tell you exact p position of the, uh, the aircraft. Because when you're going to the uh, denied territory, and at night, maybe the weather is bad, you cannot use the, uh, the celestial the, uh, nav navigation, and you cannot use any nav navigational aid. So this is the only thing they're going to rely on. So while they was in the uh, Groom Lake to learn the new technologies, the, uh, the flight crew was in Seoul Air Force Base for the training. And pretty soon, it's about two months later, the flight crew was sent to the uh, Groom Lake to uh, re-team up with the, uh, the other uh, team members. So at this time, they're going to do the integrated training. When they say integrated training with the whole crew was uh, managed by the, uh, the 34 squadron. They would take off at from Groom, uh, Groom Lake at night. And they were seen just at, uh, sometimes they was actually from there, they're going to fly low and go all the way to come up here to the Seattle. And they're going to head back. So the first thing they're going to train the, is to train the, the navigators. And then they're going to train the re electronic warfare officers. When they're doing the, uh, the night flying, the United States Air, Air Force, they will send out the US fighter to intercept. They have uh, F-4 and F-105. From different air base, they're going to try to intercept their C-130s and see if they can use the uh, electronic uh, countermeasure uh, to dodge the, the interceptors. And the lastly is after the, all this is done, they're going to do the real airdrop. Then they're going to uh, send out the crew to, you know, to a designated place. They're going to drop their package and uh, see if how accurate that they can make this thing to happen. So this take another about like a three, four months. It's about, about two, uh, yeah, about three months. So after the, all the flight training and the integrated training was completed, they were sent to Eastern Oregon for survival training. You know, so remember I was saying that the first time they saw the snow, they were excited. Right now they were surrounded by the snows. The, the only thing they felt is so cold. Cold, very cold. And then the, uh, because this is a time, that actually it's the first time they actually in the, uh, uh, in the wilderness. And I remember one of their crew members told me, he said, the, uh, at night, the next morning that they can see it, there's a couple of a dog there. So they were kind of like, oh, it's just a you know, very cute dog. So they, you know, get some meat and just, just to feed the dog. And a couple of days later, their instructor says, no, that's, that's not dog. That's a wolf. <laughs> okay, so, you know, before they send to the training, they, everyone gets a, 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 a survivor pack. Uh, the survivor packs, they have the very sharp knife, pistols, and some, uh, some ammunitions. And to their surprise, they have uh, cigarettes. You know, the, uh, each one has a carton of the cigarettes. And uh, also amazed them is not just the cigarette. The cigarette was their hometown, Taiwan. It's wow, you know, the, the United States were really taking care of us. You know, they even tried to, to resolve the, uh, the, no, the nostalgia for us. You know, so they gave us a hometown cigarette. But later on, they learned that's not the intent from the CIA. 
the CIA wants nothing to do with it. So in case the airplane actually went down in China, well, we don't have anything to do with it. And every, all the trainings, is the uh, flight training, the uh, specialized training, the survivor training, all was done. And in April of 1969, they were sent back. It was told that since the, uh, the training was so intense, so we're going to give you some R&R &R so you can uh, uh, rest in Hawaii and in uh, the Okinawa. So they will put it on to, and they also give them a charter, the 727, take them all the way back. This is, you know, you're going to stay a week in Hawaii and a week in old Okinawa. Then you're going to go home, go back to Taiwan. And this is how they did. They took off from Travis Air Force in California, going to Hawaii, and then go to Katina Air Force Base in Okinawa, and they stayed there for, for a week. And everybody was so excited. They were saying, this is, yeah, tomorrow we're going to go home, because after the week stay in Okinawa, it's going to go home. But to their surprise, the night before they're supposed to go home, the, uh, the CIA, the officer, and also the, uh, uh, their team leaders uh, uh, called them up into a meeting room and told them, says, there's a slight plan change. Uh, we're not going to go home tomorrow. We're going to go execute the mission first. Then you go home. And so since you're going to go home later, and your family were expecting you tomorrow, so you uh, might as well write them a letter to tell them you know, about the plan change. So you know, on the paper... On the table, there's a pen and papers that ask them to write a letter. And at that time, some of the uh, team members did not, uh, did not realize the gravity of that statement. So they just simply write, it says, no, I'm not going to be home tomorrow. It's going to be later. So the commander of the squadron has to make a hint saying, if there's any arrangement you wanted to make, now is the time to do it. That make them realize they was actually asked to write a final farewell letter to their loved ones. So almost immediately, the room turned into very anxious, somewhat intense, but mostly sad. Because they know, at that time, they still don't know what kind of missions they would expect to, to fly or where they're going to go. But from that, as you were saying, it's a, probably this mission's the coming, the is not going to have a good chance for them to come back. So the next day, they're going to put it on to another that the plane took off from Okinawa towards some place that they don't know. And while the airplane was flying over Taiwan, passing through you know, they can't, their hometown, they look out the window, they can see their familiar air, air base. And use the air base as a reference. They can very quickly look at their family. They can look at their house. And everybody was just staring at it and hope the airplane can fly a little slower so they can take a good look at it. No one said a word. And the silence filled the whole cabin. And finally, they landed at the... Uh, Tackley Air Base, which is the uh, Thai Royal Air, Air Force Base. And they landed there at night. After they landed, there's a bus parked right behind the, the airplane. They tell them to, after they get off, go directly into the bus. And the bus have the, the, all the window cover, which is uh, make them feel like it's, a, like, a prison, it's a, like a prison bus. And they take them to one corner of the air, air base and put it into the trailer air area and just put them there. Day and night, you know, feed them. So the people will start to getting very, the, the anxiety started to, to build up. And then they start to request, you know, because it, at that time you can see the Thailand's very wet and hot. So they just says, at least can you take, you know, put us into the swimming pool 
And this is at a very normal re request. But even with this normal request, kind of like they would say, okay, you can go to the swimming pool, but there's a, some arrangement we have to make. So one day, you know, after dark, after really dark, it was almost about 10 o'clock, there's another bus. You take them to the swimming pool area. And the swimming pool was indoor swimming pool. And all the light was shut. So everybody go in there, they lock the door, then they turn on the lights. So let them to you know, stay there for a while, then everybody get up, going to the same, ru same routine, going to the covered bus, shut the lights, back home, back to their trailers. So at that time, they still don't know where they're going to go, what they're going to do. Until a couple of days before the mission, they've been called everybody together and says, you are expect to drop two, air, two scientific instruments at Lok Nor, the nuclear test site of the communist China, which is located in the northwest portion of China. So from then on, so after they told us, this is you're going to do, so the uh, the navigator, the chief navigator, may, uh, so may, Major who started to work hard, tried to put it, everything together, says, okay, this is the route that we're going to do it, and make it, everything on the, on the paper. And after everything was uh, ready on the May 17th in the afternoon, everyone was put on, they was told to wear the civilian clothes and don't put on any identification. And after they get onto the, uh, the, that's the first time they actually see the airplanes they're gonna fly. You can see it, it says that uh, on the back, so the, the field with the, the, uh, the INS there, with the two scientific in instrument was there, and they have to go in there in the afternoon to, to align the, uh, the aircraft. And the, remember there was this two team, they was, their team was, was try, try to fly it. And it was, the plan was in case they get shut down or any mishap, so the other team will take over in, immediately. So at the five o'clock, they took off with, you know, because that airplane was just so heavily loaded, it's actually above their normal takeoff weight. And they took off to, uh, you know, saying this is for the mission impossible. So for the uh, 511, now uh, they took off, then they, uh, at about 6.30, they get into Burma. At that time, everything was still, still normal. But at around 8.30, they was actually flying in the um, valleys of uh, the Himalaya to try to get into China. At that time, they un encountered a very heavy storm was so heavy, the airplane was the rock up and down, up and down. So Major Ho has to actually alert the pilots to maintain the, the uh, uh, mission safety altitude, minimum safety uh, altitude, so it's about, about a thousand feet above the ground. But then it's after they actually get into China, the storm was gone, you know, everything was peace. But then they just about to say this is a phew, then the uh, electronic on the officer was giving them the alerts as so, well. We just been picked up by the communists, but at that time, what are you going to do? You just have still have to keep going forward. And it says until the the interceptor from the communist China showed up, we just going to keep forward. But luckily, the communists never react. They probably was never expect somebody to come in from that. Put, uh, the, from that lo location, or they don't expect them to show up at you know during that kind of uh, weather. And then this is also for this uh, flight that they put in uh, some uh, also a new technology called the Digicom, so they can just press the button. They very fastly send out a burst of the electronic signal will notify the back the, the tackly where they are. So very short, so the company, even they, they catch the signal, they don't know what that is, so fast. But then they were supposed to you know, send out the, every hour. 
But after they get into China, that thing will malfunction. So they, so they cannot send out anymore. So there's a, another option says, if you cannot just send it out through the Digicon, you can just use the regular way to send it out. But uh, the main major hold the, the decided that at that time we're not going to notify. We're just going to keep going because uh, we don't want to risk the possibility of being picked up by the communists. So they just keep going, and it's just uh, luckily, you know, the weather was good, at, uh, but it was th that day was at the new moon, so the visibility is not that good. So it's, that's good for them. And about the uh, 11 o'clock as they approach the drop zone, because there's a two drop zone, because there's a two scientific in instruments, right? So two minutes before midnight, that they dropped the first package. After you, because they were flying so low after they dropped the first package, the pilot re reported that he can actually hear the explosion from the parachutes. And that the f it was so accurate, because later on they being informed by the CIA, the first package was dropped only 20 feet away from their designated a area. And after thousands of miles that they flew, the first package was only 20 feet apart. And s two minutes after midnight, they dropped the second one. The second one was about five miles off. And the reason for the five miles off was because the drop zone was very near to a hill. And they supposed to, after they approached that, make the drop and turn toward, towards the hill. So even before takeoff, the major hole and the pilot, they, they discussed, they going to uh, change it a little bit to the other side of the hill. So make them a room for the pull up. But the five miles is still within the uh, tolerance of the mission. And then the uh, 15 minutes after midnight, that they head back, you know. So the first part, the mission is done. So the first, like I said, the first part, they were flying for the country. And after the you know, package is dropped, the second part is fly for themselves. They have to get home safe. And then the only problem on the way back was this, that they were flying low and they can see a city. They were approaching a city. And as they approach the city, they can still see the lights. But they are just about to get into the, around the city, all the light went off. So the, that, that tells them they've been, you know, the, the communists know they are there. So that was to cause another anxiety of the whole, whole crew. But then it says they were expecting to be intercepted uh, in any minute, but still nothing ha happens. And it's not until about years, years later, after I know about this operation and I wrote it into my book and it's being published, and I got an email from one of my, my readers. He says, after he read my article, that he said the, uh, he was living on, uh, along that route at that time, 1969, China and the Soviet was just, you know, it's a, you know having their skimmers, you know, they get started to uh, turning friendly into uh, adversaries. They have a, constantly, they have the air raid exercise. So constantly at night, the, uh, the city just you know, ran, randomly turn off the lights. And what just happened, they was flying right next to the city. Yeah. So at 3.30, they're flying to Burma. After they get into the Burma, they says, okay, halfway home, safe. And then it says, the nature never stopped to challenge them. You know, in the, on the way there, they have snowstorm and uh, pick up by the uh, enemy radar, the light went off. And this time, it's, it's, you know, they sent Elmer's fire. Anyone who sent Elmer's fires because the airplane flying through the clouds, they pick up a lot of aesthetic electricity, so you can see the spark at the propellers on the wingtip and even on the, uh, the wind, windshield. And that caused some of the uh, electronic in instrument to uh, went at uh, haywire. And the first thing goes is the, uh, the INS. But at that time, they don't care about the INS anymore. So they, they, there's a lot of the uh, navigational equipment that they can use. But it's, they, as they keep going, the second thing went wrong was the, uh, the fuel gauge. 
the fuel gauge you know start to the uh, flu fluctuating. At this, you cannot you know the the risk. You cannot take the risk. So they no so they notify uh, uh, Tackley says we're not going to land it back. We're going to land at the nearest Air Force Base, which is Chiang Mai. That's how they land at the uh, quarter to eight in the morning. So that's the Operation Heavy T is turning to Operation Impossible. Is the Operation Accomplished? So in summary, the uh, the mission is a total success, and CIA uh, gets the information that they needed. And the two instruments, they also work fine for the whole year until the battery ran out about a year later. And after the, uh, the, the battery ran out, they was actually thinking about to have the second mission, have them to fly the second mission. But just as the crew come back to the United States for the training, the Communist China was successfully launched their first satellite. For that reason, the... Uh, uh, the CIA decided since they have the capability to do that, you know, might as well that we don't need this mission anymore. So the second mission was uh, scrapped it a few days after they launched their first satellite. So th at this time, they, uh, 50 years, so we start to look back and says the Operation Heavy T is a perfect example of the cooperation between the uh, Republic of China and the United States. You know, even uh, starting way back in the uh, 1941, you know, the Flying Tiger and all the way to the uh, Black Mass. So I always tell my friends this, everybody knows the United States has sent one, that, uh, one army to the that, uh, China, you know, Flying Tiger to help the Chinese to fight against the Japanese. But not too many people knows Taiwan actually have uh, two squadrons. One is a black bat, the other one's a black cat, which is fly the U U twos. You know, so the Chinese Taiwan, the Republic of China have two squadrons who are helping the United States during the Cold Wars. And this will conclude my the uh, telling about the Operation Heavy T. Thank you. The next session is that uh, panel discussion. I assume most of the people, after all this uh, presentation, you must be have a lot of uh, questions already. So, um, Art, go ahead. Mr. Ho is the navigator for that uh, uh, heavy T, okay? So I would like to introduce him. Uh, let's see. Yeah, this is uh, uh, Zha Ming Ho. Uh, of, uh, let me see. Yeah. He started with that uh, uh, Air Force Preparation School in 1952 in Chengdu. Uh, that time still uh, Republic of China. And then he continued on into the Air Force Academy. And he went through the, the Air Force career and the last assignment is at the Navy uh, uh, Navigator for that uh, uh, Chinese Air Force uh, Transportation Wing. Um, right. He's the one actually to guide through all this uh, uh, heavy tea, the C-130, get into that uh, China uh, and drop that the number one and the number two that uh, uh, sensors in the, the atom sign. Okay, uh, please go over there. So uh, if you have any question, and then I think Kel and the uh, lady over there will uh, give you that uh, uh, speakers. Go ahead, over there. Uh, my name's Dan Harrington. I like the talk very much, but a couple of questions come to my mind. When was this declassified? 
about black cat and black bat because it used to be uh, kind of an eyes only type of operations where it was very compartmentized and it was highly classified. Thank you. Well, I cannot tell you exact date, but I can see uh, the Chris Pocock, uh, he published his first book, uh, Dragon Lady, which uh, talk about the black bat. And later on, he also published another book. And I learned the whole story just around that time. I was saying this is in the uh, early 1990s. And normally with the uh, 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 classified, the, the thing is just 25 years so for, the, uh, for the secret uh, the cl classification, 25 years. So if this happens in 1965, it was 25 years, that's, that's 1990s. So I think it's just about the same time. If I could add a little bit to that, a lot of the revelations from our government came after the Chinese, the People's Republic, and the Republic of China began sharing their intercept information. So the 34th Squadron knew where they had lost their people, and the Chinese came back and said, well, we had interceptions at these locations at that time. So it really came out from those two governments before the CIA started to put detail on it. It's my understanding that they still only released about 90%, so there's still 10% with the lid on it out there. Any other questions? Over there. Hi. Um, I am the son of one of the uh, 34 pilots that was uh, you know, he would sacrifice himself in uh, 1965. So, as far as I know, that uh, after 1965, there were very few casualties of, of, of the 34. So most of the aircraft were lost either right after 1965 or before 1965. So there were 15 aircraft that lost and hundreds of pilots that are, you know. And as family, we were always being given information that they were missing. You know, they never officially pronounced dead until 30 years later. And they were all buried with, with their uniform, you know, without their body. So, uh, so what, what, what's the, uh, I mean, we, 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 we never heard anything that, you know, prior to, to, to the, you know, your mission in 1969. What about those people that ha has, uh, you know, lost their life, those 15 aircraft that were shot down? That, for sure, they were, you know, they're performing duty for Taiwan, ROC, and the CIA. So maybe you guys can give a little bit of information about those, uh, you know, people that those aircraft I had lost during those years. Well, you started out in 1954, uh, and uh, CIA first they, uh, to equip the uh, Chinese Air Force, the uh, 34 Squadron with uh, P4Y. And they took one and started to fly deep into China, and and also B twenty uh, the you know B twenty six and B seventeens, and the, of course then they have the 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 P two Vs. Uh, over the years, like I says the uh, four P two Vs got you know, you know, shut down, or and then uh, I think a three B seventeens and one B uh, B twenty six. And, but the, with the uh, communist China's the, uh, the defending ability started to get up, and I think it was just like you said, the 1965 was the very rarely actually going to China anymore. And this one is one exception, you know, because the this was the first time they used the C-130, and the only time they used the C-130. Uh, and yeah, of course, they have a lot of the uh, ca casualties prior to 1965. And I wrote a, a few books uh, you know, talking about the sacrifice of, the, of what, the, what they've done for us. Yeah. I guess two questions. Uh, number one, where does where the name uh, HBT come from? And also, do you have a Chinese translation for HBT? Well, in Chinese, we call the Operation Qilong, Magic Dragon. Magic Dragon. Uh, the Magic Dragon, Qilong. But the, in the CIA, they designated it as the Heavy T. Just a name from the air. 
Thank you. I think uh, heavy tea is a code name, you know, the secret code name. Any other? Over there, gentlemen. Actually, I don't have any question about the excellent presentation here, but to this gentleman that uh, is a descendant of those gallant men that uh, lost their life uh, in, in the dark and uh, never be remembered by them, by especially the Taiwanese government nowadays. Uh, I want to say a few words. In our generation, people like me, we owe it. We owe our life, owe our American dream to those people that sacrifice their life. And we might never know them, but uh, they are our hero. They are real heroes with the highest um, moral uh, fiber in their, in their DNA. And um, forever, we are in, in debt to them. Thank you. Yeah. Why not you stand up, like that, everybody? Thank you for your help for the Chinese government. Any other questions? Come over here, and also we want to thank you that uh, uh, Black Bat Foundation to provide that uh, uh, funeral position video. We have to thank that uh, uh, ROC Veteran Association in Seattle. Uh, they organized this event to, to uh, drum up a lot of Chinese audience over here, and we have to thank that uh, Museum of Flight and Cal and Marilyn to help to you know, provide such a nice facility and opportunity for us. Thank you, everybody come over here, thank you.